Welcome, good morning, good to see you here at uh, the St Nicholas Barthampton live stream. Uh, welcome to regular members and those who are um, visiting, if there is anybody. I'll just shut my door because there you can hear some traffic news from traffic uh, noise from the bypass. Um, I don't know whether you find these services like a, a, a wonderful spiritual experience, a mountaintop experience with God or whether it's a bit of an effort and discipline to keep up the habit of church and uh, that important priority. When Moses had his mountaintop experience, which we were reminded of a couple of weeks ago when we heard about Jesus meeting Moses and Elijah up a mountain, God revealed himself to Moses and in Exodus 34, verse 6, the Lord himself passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That's the same Lord in whose presence we're meeting this morning. Um, the Lord who is compassionate and gracious slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. We tremble before him, but we're welcomed by him. Before we sing our first hymn about him, let's just pause and pray. Lord God, you are just and holy, and we don't deserve to come into your presence, but you are abounding in love and faithfulness you're compassionate and gracious and so you welcome us in and we rejoice in that and ask that we might be encouraged in our hearts this morning to trust and live for you help us to encourage one another in whatever way we can today amen well let's sing to god about him great is thy faithfulness
Jesus told a story about a shepherd that had a hundred sheep and one of them wandered off and got lost and the shepherd left the other 99 and went out to find the lost sheep and when he found it he was thrilled and really pleased and excited and had a big party and Luke told us about that story. Matthew told us about that story as well in his gospel so it's a really good and important one for us to hear. When Luke tells us about that story he also told two other stories with a similar theme about lost things. I wonder if you know uh, what if you can remember what those things were. Well there was a woman who had ten special coins and lost one of her coins and then found it and was really really pleased and so you see the theme. They're quite similar stories aren't they? And there was also a man who lost his son because the boy wandered off went away from his father but when the boy came back the father welcomed him home and Jesus was saying that father is like God and we've wandered away from him but he is delighted to welcome us back and we've just been singing about how faithful God is and if we think about ourselves we're not faithful. There are times when we turn our backs on God, when we live as if we weren't his children and we do and say and think things that are wrong and displease him. But he's promised to forgive us and this confession prayer that we often use, um, we're going to have now in the time while the, the boys and girls I think are still with us for the first part of the service after junior church and uh, it's a prayer for us as, as a, a family to say together you might like to join with me in saying it out loud let's return to the Lord our God and say to him father we have sinned against heaven and against you we are not worthy to be called your children we turn to you again have mercy on us, bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you Father God that you love us like that father loving his son, like the shepherd loving his lost sheep and the, the woman caring about her coin and searching and finding and being glad. Thank you that you are so pleased when we come back to you and so please help us to keep trusting your forgiveness and trusting and following the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now one thing I'd quite like to tell the boys and girls about before uh, you go and do whatever you're doing next is something that's happened in our church family. Uh, you may remember a lovely lady called Hilary Salmon. There's a picture of her. And Hilary died last month, which is very sad for us. We'll miss her. And we had a special service called a funeral the day before yesterday in church and uh, so Hilary's body was in the coffin there in church as we remembered her and gave thanks to God for her and you would think when somebody's died it would be a very sad time and it is and it was but that funeral service was also a special time with happiness in it as well because Jesus has promised that for everyone who trusts in him there's life with him forever after we've died. And so when we put Hilary's body in the ground in the churchyard we buried her and you might recognise if you come to St Nick's 
the path there and the um, up at the top corner over there is where the gate near the school is and here's there's the little wall um, by the path people were all quite socially distanced because of coronavirus so we weren't gathered around close to the grave but you can see in that let's just make that picture big for a minute they there's me uh, next to the the hole the grave where we buried Hillary's body and it's in hope knowing that Jesus uh, will rise raise us up again so Hillary's resting in Jesus now but looking forward to being raised again because Jesus rose from the dead we can all look forward to rising again with him if we trust him so there's something that we often say together in in church is the creed a, a way of, ex, of explaining briefly what our faith is what we believe in and uh, here's a, a video of several members of the church saying it um, and all put together because we'd like to say it together and so let's listen to this and you might like to to join in as well maybe you understand some of it and don't really understand all of it um, it's a chance to think about it and uh, be reminded of what Christians believe especially about Jesus who rose from the dead and so at the end when we say I believe in the resurrection of the body we're looking forward to joining him in that and the communion of saints is where believers are in fellowship together those who've died and got, gone before us and died and those who are still alive and those in the future we're all part of one fellowship with Jesus so uh, here's the creed I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We had junior church happening in, I think, three groups on Zoom this morning. Um, sounds as though they were having a, a really good time. Um, if you are young enough to be eligible for that, if you go to school or you're of that age, um, do get in touch or get uh, parents or somebody to get in touch for us if you'd like to join in junior church. and. Um, if you have been at junior church and you don't want to stay around for the whole of the the live stream service now that's fine and we're carrying on with the bit more grown up part of the service and um, everybody's welcome to stay in it but we're going to hear two readings from the bible now brought to us by carl micah chapter 6 verses 6 to 8 with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The New Testament reading is from Matthew 18 verses 1 to 14. The greatest kingdom of heaven. 
At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their necks and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that was wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Carl, for reading that. And uh, as we were watching on the screen, you may have noticed in the first reading, the Old Testament reading from Micah, I'd highlighted some of the words in verse 8 what the Lord requires of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God and the reason I've highlighted those three um, things is that those are going to be the three titles of the next three sermons which are all from Matthew chapter 18 um, and today it's walk humbly so we're going to be thinking a bit more about those first 14 verses of Matthew 18. If you've got your own Bible, um, do have it open there for the sermon. Before we uh, do that, we're going to have another song either to listen to or to join in. The words will be on the screen about how Jesus will hold on to us. Jesus, the good shepherd who cares and uh, our Father in heaven who's not willing that one of these little ones should perish. He will hold me fast.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that our Saviour Jesus will hold us fast, hold on to us and stop us from falling. Thank you for your word by which he does that. So please use your word that we've heard this morning and take it deeper into our hearts that we might trust you more securely and encourage one another more in that trust. For Jesus' sake, Amen. One thing I hear quite often about why people go to church is that they want to feel uplifted. We want to feel better about ourselves so we can face the week ahead. We want to be told, you're actually quite a good Christian, keep going as you are. And if we can be told that we're right and somebody else is wrong, well what could make us feel better than that? It's sometimes said that Jesus turns things upside down. Looking at life in his way is totally different from how we naturally look at things. It must have been hard for Jesus' disciples to get their heads around. He kept shocking them with these revolutionary revelations. No wonder they kept getting things wrong. Peter with his shelter building offer on the mountain, the others with their failed demon casting out efforts, which we heard uh, last week. Back in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, Jesus said this, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist, Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, I wonder if what Jesus said in chapter 17 on the way down the mountain, which we read two weeks ago, reminded the disciples of that which he said a bit earlier. Imagine the, what the disciples were thinking. He's talking about John the Baptist, Johnny B again. What a player. Johnny B is the, the Elijah promised by the prophet Malachi. Jesus said he, John, was the greatest. But then he said we're all even greater than John the Baptist. How uplifting is that? And then the natural question is, well, yes, I know I'm really great. I know we all are, Jesus, but I want to know my ranking in the class. Do I... Do I come top? Who's the greatest? Do you think that's the thinking behind verse 1 in today's reading? And Jesus' response turned them on their heads again. 
here are three ways in which he challenges us with them to think differently. First, you are more needy than you think. Verses one to four, you're more needy than you think. In response to their question, Jesus employs the services of a visual aid. There are obviously other people around and Jesus calls one of them over. Could you, could you just um, come and up here, please? and stand up, up here near those big men. Thank you. Now, now everybody, look at him. That's what you need to be like. You need, to ch you need a change of heart here, guys. What was that child like? Well, able to stand up, we can tell, clearly, but probably no more than a toddler, maybe two or three years old. Here's your role model. The commentator Dick France said uh, in this commentary on this point, a child was a person of no importance in Jewish society, subject to the authority of his elders, not taken seriously except as a responsibility, one to be looked after, not one to be looked up to. To change and become like little children is therefore a radical reorientation from the mentality of the rat race to an acceptance of insignificance. The most lowly is the greatest. Acceptance of inferiority is even an entrance requirement for the kingdom. Children are looked after protected, provided for and cared for. They can't do those things for themselves. If we want to be with Jesus, we need to accept our lowliness, our neediness, our poverty, our helplessness. You may or may not feel this is an uplifting message, but Jesus says it is one we have to take to heart and he says, the meek shall inherit the earth. This is how to become great in the kingdom of heaven. Greatness comes only from relationship to Jesus. Admit that you are more needy than you think. Second, sin is more serious than you think. Verses five to nine in Matthew 18, sin is more serious than you think. The little one in Jesus' illustration becomes representative then of the Christian, any Christian. We saw last week the difference between what Jesus called little faith and what he called a small amount of real faith. Someone with a small amount of real faith is like a child, a little one. So when Jesus talks in the rest of this passage about little ones, he's talking about people who trust Jesus, our fellow Christians. All true greatness comes from relationship to Jesus. So if we welcome them because they belong to him, we are welcoming him. And if we're parents or grandparents or, or we know children, we might want to apply this particularly and think particularly about little ones who are literally little. But we need to broaden our thinking as well to think about other Christians, perhaps new Christians, especially uh, or any of the, the little ones who believe in him. The flip side of this is also something we need to take seriously. Uh, we welcome Jesus because welcome people who belong to Jesus because of him, we welcome him. And the flip side, treat, treating our fellow Christians with care and treasuring them as little children is our responsibility. And what a terrible thing to stick your foot out and trip up a little child as they run past and laugh as they fall on their nose and cry. And yet sometimes, is that what we do in some way to our fellow Christians, cause them to stumble, cause them to sin. Maybe we're so keen to be inclusive, we rightly want to welcome everybody as they are. 
but forget to mention how Jesus doesn't want to leave us as we are. He wants us all to change and become like little children. And then he wants to change us and make us more like him. So if we say it doesn't matter who you sleep with, that's a private matter and nothing to do with religion, we could be causing one of those little ones to sin and stumble. It's very serious. Or suppose we live in a way that's not recognisably Christian. We treat church as an unimportant thing. We say, oh, it's fine to go and play golf or rugby or go shopping instead. What message are we giving to the little ones? Could we be causing them to stumble in their journey of following Jesus? Or perhaps we're harsh and judgmental. Someone slips up and misses church or tells a lie or fails to keep a commitment and we come down on them like a ton of bricks or or we don't say anything to their face but we talk about it to everyone else behind their backs you know I don't think so and so is very Christian do you know what they did one way or another we cause that little Christian to stumble rather than encouraging them to trust and follow Jesus or we make them feel like an outsider when they come to church. We, we might think we haven't actually done anything wrong, but by our unwelcoming attitude, if we cause someone to drift away and stumble, Jesus says this is very, very serious. This is much more serious than we think. There is a coming judgment from God which is so severe that by comparison a quick drowning would be merciful. I don't want to be the one who causes someone to sin. And if we need another point to tell us how serious sin is, look at verse 8. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. It's very common for people to joke about eternal judgment and about hell. But I think you can only do that if you don't believe Jesus' words. He's not telling us literally to chop hands off and feet off and gouge out eyes. But he does mean what he says very seriously. It literally would be worse to go to hell intact than to go to these drastic lengths to avoid it if that were possible. But of course, if you could get rid of sin by cutting off the bits that cause the sin, the knife could never go deep enough to keep us from sin. The root cause of the problem of sin in our life is not in the hand or the eye or the foot, but in the heart. Sin is more serious than you think. Well, we're not feeling very uplifted at that point, Jesus. But let's hear the rest of what Jesus had to say in our reading. What Jesus says here is echoed in the Christianity Explored course, which I've led many times and seen a good number of people come to know and understand and trust the Lord Jesus. One of the key phrases in that course, which is based on Mark's gospel, is I am more wicked than I ever imagined, but more loved than I ever dreamed. You are more wicked than you ever imagined, but more loved than you ever dreamed. And we've seen Jesus challenge our thinking in seeing that uh, we're more needy than we think and sin is more serious than we think. And Jesus tells us thirdly that he is more gracious than you think. Verses 10 to 14, Jesus is more gracious than you think. His anger at the one who causes a little one to stumble 
is the flip side of his love for the little one. He doesn't want us to stumble. He doesn't want us to fall into judgment. He doesn't want us to choose the road to hell. He loves his little ones. I love talking about the Christian faith with people who are not yet convinced but are open-minded or who've recently put their trust in Jesus and so come to things some of us are familiar with with fresh eyes. One question that came up in the last Christianity Explored group was someone's reaction to Jesus comparing people to sheep. It seemed a bit rude. If you call someone a sheep, you're probably implying that they're intellectually challenged and perhaps that they follow the crowd instead of thinking for themselves. But it struck me that in biblical times when wealth would be reflected in large flocks rather than fast cars, sheep were not despised as stupid but rather treasured as valuable and also protected as vulnerable with wild animals around that would like to help themselves. So Jesus the Good Shepherd treasures and protects us his sheep. Yes we are prone to wander but he cares. He has a large flock but he cares for the individual. The Good Shepherd leaves the 99 on the open hills to search for the one that wandered into danger. What about the other 99? Shouldn't he have left the one in order to care for the 99? Well, in some extraordinary way, Jesus' point is that he loves the individual. You can't write off one individual for the sake of the many. The many in the parable are okay. They haven't wandered off. If he finds the one, he is happier about that little one than about the 99 bigger ones. How do you feel about that? Are you that little one? Are you wandering from Jesus in some way, in your heart perhaps? Are you wandering from Jesus in your choices? He cares. He loves you. He wants you back. You may be feeling guilty. Well, he's not saying it's okay. It's okay to keep wandering. He cares too much to say that. He's saying he would love to have you back. He treasures you. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And that's not just saying he loved and died for the whole world, which we all know is true. It's saying he loved me and gave himself for me. What about you? That is an uplifting message. Not that I'm a good Christian or I'm doing well enough or I'm better than someone else or I'm right and they're wrong. But I was a lost sheep and Jesus found me. I'm a little one and he treasures me. He values me enough to give his life for me. He values me despite what I'm like. He loves the unlovely. Charles Simeon was a contemporary and friend of William Wilberforce. And he's been described as one of the greatest and most persuasive preachers the Church of England has ever known. He served as vicar of Holy Trinity Church in the centre of Cambridge for 54 years from 1782 until his death. At first, his church wardens opposed his ministry, giving him a miserable time for 12 years and even locking him out of the church. But by his final years there, the final years of his life, there was standing room only in the church. 
Simeon wrote and taught on how to preach. His declared aim in preaching was to humble the sinner, exalt the saviour and promote holiness. He would have found that very natural in this passage of scripture. We are more needy than we think. Sinners humbled. Sin is more serious than we think. Holiness promoted. Jesus is more gracious than we think. Saviour exalted. The King of Love, my shepherd, is you may well be familiar with this hymn. I hear it's going to be sung to us. And again, if you'd like to, to join in, of course, feel free at home. Um, something we wouldn't be allowed to do gathering together in church. Uh, but as we reflect on the love of the Good Shepherd, um, let's thank him in our hearts for his love for us. And so let's pray to him and uh, Nigel is going to lead us in prayer now. As we mourn the passing of Hilary Salmon, gracious God, surround us and all who mourn this day with your continuing compassion. Do not let grief overwhelm your children or turn them against you. 
when grief seems never ending, take them one step at a time along your road of death and resurrection. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For hospital staff and researchers, gracious God, particularly at this time, give skill, sympathy and resilience to all who are caring for the sick and your wisdom to those searching for a cure. Strengthen them with your spirit that through you their work, many will be restored to health through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord of creation, whose glory is around and within us, open our eyes to your wonders that we may serve you with reverence and know your peace at our lives end through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let us pray for the work of the PCC and our forthcoming APCM. Lord, grant wisdom and guidance to all who serve so selflessly on the PCC of your Church of St. Nicholas. May they be guided to always do your work and to continue to provide a place of worship and comfort for all. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us combine all our prayers in one with us all in our houses saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will will be done as on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Nigel. And uh, sorry, I got the words up a bit late on uh, the Lord's Prayer, but I guess most of us know it by heart. Um, before we sing our final hymn, um, we've got our usual spot for some church news and notices. And um, do text in that um, texting hasn't, we didn't get so many in the, the last few weeks. Um, back in August we had a couple of services that were recorded rather than live but we're very much live again now and uh, one of the advantages of that is the the interactive thing so we'd love to hear a greeting um, from each other and greet one another um, by sending in a text and maybe you have a question um, so do feel free if you've got a question about the sermon or um, yeah really on the on the theme of uh, today's reading and sermon um, PCC News, um, we met on Thursday, thank you Nigel for praying for PCC. Um, we've made the decision to uh, work towards taking our services back into um, coming from church, carrying on a live stream, so a bit like this, mm. but it will change form a bit, we'll probably have less music in it. Um, and uh, details being worked out there are technical challenges involved and I think it means that that to start with it won't be open to everyone who wants to to come um, it'll be the sort of studio for the live stream and then once we get up and running after a couple of weeks we'll start inviting people and there'll probably have to be a booking system um, to make sure that we're not just turning people away at the door so it's carrying on as a live stream service, but moving to church and working towards um, everyone who wants to being able to come in to church um, to be part of that and seeing it there, uh, encouraging one another with recognizing that a large part of the congregation is still at home for various reasons. Um, the other exciting uh, and challenging PCC news is that Kay, our, our administrator, who's been doing a terrifically helpful job, is wanting to hand that over to somebody else. Um, so we're looking to appoint a new um, administrator and uh, also the possibility of appointing a families outreach mm -hmm. worker. Um, 
details to be worked out um, and there'll be I think more news to follow on that but do pray um, for us in working that out well and making good use of resources for Jesus glory and kingdom. The annual meeting as I, I hope you realise by now and have in your diary is on the 11th of October at four o'clock on Zoom. Um, the Zoom number is in an email that I sent out to the email update list. If you're not on that update list, um, go on the church website and sign up for the list. If you're having any trouble with that, do get in touch. Um, the electoral role, our, our role of church membership, is being revised as it is annually and so that revision is open at the moment. Um, the email had a, a form attached so that if you're um, not on the roll and would like to join, um, please fill that in. Um, and if so if you live in the parish or you have been attending worship in the parish for six months, you're eligible basically and uh, if you want to change any of your details or come off the roll, please be in touch. And um, today's virtual coffee uh, may well have a card game in it, so bring at least one suit of a pack of cards per person to virtual coffee. Um, we didn't actually play it last week when we had been going to, um, but uh, we'll see how it goes today. and. Um, perhaps have a bit of fun together and um, be good to see each other's faces and see how we're all, all getting on. Here's a, a beautiful song uh, that is a helpful way for us to respond to what we've heard about what about Jesus's grace that he left the realms of glory for the cross and he's the good shepherd who found us who had wandered astray and there's an encouragement here that even though we're secure in his arms days of darkness still may meet me sorrow's path I often tread but his presence is still with me and by his guiding hand I'm led uh, so let's uh, rejoice in that and praise him for what he has done for us.
here are the texts that have come in. Um, Anna Young says, morning all, look forward to seeing you at coffee. Thanks, Anna. And Samuel Frith, hello everyone. I'm loving the beautiful weather and scenery this week. God is a great creator. Has been lovely to have that extension to summer after it seemed to have gone, hasn't it? And Phil Edge says, please pray for Bishop Peter, who has completed his first round of chemo. Please pray for our Aunt Margaret, still with no speech, but improving. Also, please let us know about your dad. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, Phil, um, for asking. And dad is uh, out, of, he's been out of intensive care for a bit now and um, slowly improving in hospital, uh, still quite confused on and off and um, hoping to be back home at the end of uh, this week. Um, and uh, mum's having a stair lift fitted this week as well and um, we had a lovely zoom call yesterday afternoon with dad with all four of his children and lots of his grandchildren and um, had a time of prayer together which was uh, very moving for for him and for all of us um, so a lot to thank god for um, and do appreciate your prayers for him and mum let's pray now Heavenly Father, we thank you for your hand on Bishop Peter and it's such a, a difficult challenge for him and for the diocese. Um, undergoing difficult treatment and we thank you that this treatment is possible and pray that you would strengthen and help him, give him confidence in your goodness and love. Give him peace and patience and healing, we pray. And help other leaders in the diocese to rally round and to encourage us all to serve you faithfully. And we pray for um, Phil's aunt Margaret um, with no speech we ask that her speech might return and that you would draw near to her and help her and each member of the family to look to you and thank you father for um, your presence clearly felt with my dad and um, we ask that you would help him uh, and continue your work of healing in his body and may this not cause ongoing confusion. Please strengthen mum as she prepares to care for him, keep them safe and help us all to keep looking to you, the Good Shepherd. Amen. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. May the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.